Hey, Tanya, I'm so glad we're together again for another episode of Ask Mom and Dad. And so we've got the studio audience here because this morning. I'm so glad we could bring them in this good, conversation, good at least probably this time, Wish without any interruption. I could see intro. them. It'd be a little less, like, lonely. I don't know. Anyway. Well, we're going to have to pretend like we were with a, because I know this now, like they were when they did the Rolling Stones' latest album, their first one in 18 years, where they were in a studio and they just put each other across the room from one another so they could feed off of one another's energy. So you and I <laughs> okay, are here today to feed off of one another's energy. I'm just glad I don't turn 80 this year like Mick Jagger does. I'm so also glad of that. Makes me a little nervous with someone like Mick Jagger that you yet. might be feeding off of someone's energy. It sounds more vampiric than it does just helpful. <laughs> Yeah. I know he doesn't drink alcohol, but to, does he drink something else? The uh, picture comes to the mind. The blood of the youth. Oh, that's so terrible. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> Maybe it's just the fountain of youth. That's more like water. Well, that's, that's what vampires You know, the is. living water. That's what we normally get to yeah. talk about. Living water. It's a lot more youthful. It's eternal. Itar. It, it, it is eternal. We learned about tar, too, this week. Tanya and I have, have, um, thought we'd come together and talk to you about Nothing. Not really. We've got a bunch of topics on, on, on the desk here in front of me that we can talk about. and um, But it's a special episode, <laughs> not just the, oh, we came back again episode. It's the special episode because yesterday we celebrated 36 years of marriage. Yep. Do you Are you going to go back and revisit the tar statement you just made and didn't follow that up? <laughs> We spent we learned all of that our asphalt was very important in we ancient spent, uh, Israel. A lot of our anniversary and the day before, kind of chilling out and just watching archaeology videos, which were really fascinating. They were. That's what that tar statement was. But yes, yes. we had our thirty sixth anniversary, which we felt like thirty five. The year thirty five was a long year for some reason. That may be because we started celebrating it way too early, and then it just turned to thirty six. So. I don't know. That's weird. Yeah. When we say long year, we don't mean that in the exasperating and exhausting to be married to you again for another year. We <laughs> no. mean that in the in fact, so it was a short awesome year, probably. To be married to you forever. And no, forever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting off to a good start. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I did all sorts of, I tried to find poems. I decided, hey, uh, like usual, I interact with weird devices on the internet because I'm a little geeky and I got on chat GPT to see if it could write you a cute poem. It, <laughs> it couldn't write you a cute poem. What did? No, that I, one was kind of cute. that one? I don't know if I've got it still here. Chat GPT, there it is. You know, like we did in uh, grade school, roses are red, violets are blue. Oh yeah, it wasn't the, my <laughs> wife and I were happy for 20 years, then we met. That wasn't true. That's not the poem. That was the... <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> you and I were happy for 20 years, then we met. It was That was a joke. Um, don't remember that one. No, I didn't read it to you. That was just one that I looked at. So it's, um, nope, it was roses are red, violets are blue, and Ecclesiastes 419, our love's in view. Two are better than one, the scripture says. Together we've weathered life's craziest days. That doesn't even rhyme. No, and that's not the same one. No. Um, that's an okay one. because Roses are red, but... violets are blue, 36 years, and we still haven't got a clue. We've laughed, we've cried, we've stumbled along, but hey, at least our love's still strong. There you go. I like that one. That was one. the one that we thought was the best. <laughs> that's um, the one we thought we would... Post somewhere or, you know, put it up in our Well, we just posted camper. it officially. We just posted it right here on the Ask Mom and Dad. Oh, I meant in front of us so we could remember that. Oh, you yeah, know, that we don't get that one of there's another. value. Yeah, you didn't like the one that had to do with um, burning your dinner. That was smoke. Setting, uh, the smoke alarm thing was funny. It was the one that said uh, 36 years we're still cracking jokes even when you burn dinner and set off smoke, <laughs> which is funny because we don't burn dinner. Here, I mean, can you think of a time we've actually burned something? Well, but burned do we toast, set off the smoke alarm? But the smoke alarm goes off yeah. all the time. Yeah, we were talking all to Josiah about that. And how we have a fan. We've on always the smoke alarm. had family smoke alarms that just have their own mind about things. They do not probably help us when an actual fire occurs, but the smoke alarm just fills the heat and says, "Danger, danger, Will Robinson! Nothing's really happening." <laughs> Stranger danger. No, that's not the right one. Danger, Will Robinson. Day. Does who gets that? Do you have to be over 40 to get the Danger Will Robinson? Possibly. I think I've heard our kids say it, but they didn't really know the reference, I don't think. I'm uh, not sure. We grew up in the 80s. That's a, a good meme on Instagram, by the way. There's lots of stuff that you look at and go, yeah, people don't have any idea in the world what these things were. Yeah, but you hear um, them said a lot. I mean, it's kind of cool. Yeah. It's, it shows our age. Right? Okay. Riddle, why did the couple of 36 years open a bakery? Oh, you told me this one. Because day, they realized they've been cooking up love recipes together for decades. Uh, <laughs> Why did okay, we start why cheesy. did we start a gardening club? 
need to quote it. I don't know. Because we've mastered the art of cultivating love and okay. patience. That's and enough. that leads us into our topic for today. See, I was lead, I was going somewhere. Oh, you were? Trying okay. to learn from my son in radio. You know, hey, you can transition with something stupid into something <laughs> that's probably also stupid because we're not real fond of the songs on that station. Um, no, so, they, they have cool names. He's always doing some. I like the what he, what he does with those names and transitions. All right, so let's, let's talk about what 36 years of marriage and why we still... I was going to say why we don't want to kill each other st- after 36 years, but there's no guarantee that we haven't had yeah, our one to kill each other. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I still like the um, the quote from um, uh, Ruth, Ruth, Ann Bell Graham. Graham. Ruth Bell Graham. Yeah, about, you know, she, divorce was never a question, but murder... Possibility, you know, because <laughs> you you know divorce is wrong. Right, it doesn't really not really clear in the scriptures how far you can take <laughs> getting. Uh, anyway, that's just a joke. But um, the idea that no matter how long you've been married, you're really gonna still struggle the same ways. I was reading yesterday um, about uh, uh, actually it wasn't completely about marriage. It was more like the um, struggle that Paul was having with some of his Corinthian people, and it and I thought of marriage because it's all the same type of battle. It's just a a mental battle of what is truth and what you're pressing forward to. You can't. We just said a minute ago. You can't ask your spouse to be your savior, and you can't rely on them in ways that humans just can't live up to which we tend to do if we're not careful of these expectations and stuff. But if you find a medium ground and we're able to fight the correct battles, I remember writing in my journal, one of the things you always said to me, and, and it it sticks, except it's still what we fight, it feels like, is that remember we're on the same team. We're fighting for the same things. Well, I don't know that it always feels that way, but it is truth if you've married someone who loves Jesus and wants truly for this marriage to succeed or for the children to be raised in a, in a in a home that's got some stability or has some, you know, loving parents, even if an article I was reading, oh, actually, that Keith Green pamphlet we have on what to think about before you divorce, and one of them was uh, he knew some people who said they were just, just staying together for the kids. But but that even is a piece of unselfishness. Well, and the yeah. bottom line to marriage is, is trying to find some unselfishness. Right? Yeah. Right. Because if you're married just for you, you you're no one's going to be able to please you. There's no way you can ever be fulfilled, quote unquote, with that right. other person. You can't put that on them. So marriage itself is never getting there, but realizing that that's not what it's about. Anyway, when I was reading this um, in the uh, passage, I think it's Second Corinthians 10, I thought of it. And for some reason, it just seemed to apply. Um, for though we live in the body or in the flesh, we don't wage war in a fleshly way or in an unspiritual way, since the weapons of our warfare aren't worldly, but they're powerful through God for the de- demolition of strongholds. We demolish arguments and every high-minded thing that raises up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. And then the next statement I don't really understand, but we're ready to punish any disobedience once your obedience has been confirmed. I think that's about myself. Like I want to punish my own disobedience. Once I've realized that you are obedient, then I can deal with me kind of, I don't know. I don't exactly understand that statement. But but the stronghold of the powerful... um, mental arguments basically that the enemy has tried to introduce and that we have to take captive to remind ourselves this isn't the battle the battle is truly in this case staying married so that kids have a stable home today that's that's the whole thing is oh well you can i mean and it was about 30 or 40 years ago with the whole you know, free love movement why do you have to stay married well i mean it's not make you happy you know so <laughs> If that's what it's about, sure, no no actual relationship at all is ever going to be enough or good enough, you know. But if there's a higher reason, deeper purpose in marriage, which is for a stable home for children, and it is a partnership of seeing and growing together and just demolishing strongholds that have worked their way against the mind of Christ in us, then there's a whole lot more going on there. 
<laughs> anyway, didn't mean to go into all that, but you're kind of staring can, at me. I was like going to say, can you give me a conclusion and an invitation? Because <laughs> it's, a, it's a good sermon. I'm, I'm a, no, I, no, it's good. I was, I'm, I'm not, you don't, don't. What? You're making fun of me? <laughs> no, well, yes, but in the right kind of ways that you're, yeah. Now I feel bad. Did I say something? I was just like, give me, so, you know, a conclusion invitation is sick. So all that being said, this is what we should be doing with that information. So that's what I mean by, you know, right. An there's a deeper set of reasons Something's to deeper, stay right. married is what right. I was trying to get at. See, that's an invitation. I already said it. Yeah. I said okay. exactly that. <laughs> well, that's what happens when you what I to a think guy who's is... old and forgets his, forgets the main point. Five seconds ago. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's headlines and there's, never mind. Go ahead. Sorry. What? Um, well, I was trying to say that the the issues of the church, which God says several places, especially in Paul's writings, that the issues of the church are like the issues in marriage. They're the same type of fight. Mm -hmm. We fight to to stay together. We fight to let him be the powerful one, the one that is the one answering prayers, the one who is doing the work, not us. And, the you know, that we take the humble stance and let God fight our battles for us and those kinds of things. That's all true for the church. It's also true in marriage. That we don't, we don't stay married just for the sake of it, or just for, you know. There's there's a whole lot of reasoning that faithfulness and and faithfulness itself. I mean, God shows His faithfulness to us so much in the Scripture through so many ups and downs of people believing Him or using whatever He's given them or trusting Him or whatever. Continues to come back and say, "I love you." We kind of reference Micaiah's song, Waiting, because it's it's God appealing to his people. I'm here. I'm ready. I want to love you past all your flaws, but you have to come back to me. You know, it, you have to return. And it's so not in about humility, your own you're saying faithfulness. In, being willing to, in the marital context, you're saying to be humble in the sense to turn away from your own selfish desires and humble yourself to come back to the... Well, the, and the, yeah, because you, you, you people that you know, ditch this person for another person and you still take yourself with you. So you've got to realize it's not about you as much as it's about keeping on and forgiveness and, and yeah, getting to where you can put yourself as less and second and or aside so that there are bigger purposes going on. I just think it's... And so choosing to endure is what you're saying in that regard. To stick it together. I'm making notes on what you're saying, so I don't forget what you're saying, because um, you. Uh, so, what the reason I the reason I I'm saying that is that what I was triggered by in this conversation, triggered in a positive triggering <laughs> way, was I um, was thinking about what we could talk about as far as what are the things that we can do to what what has gotten us here? Because that's the question everybody. Has. Well, this, it was funny. Um, in our church, uh, they make us stand up for birthdays and anniversaries, and they sing to us. Well, I'm standing in the choir. It's a small church, small choir. So I'm the only one standing up in choir, which is funny. It's one thing to be asked to stand up in front of a congregation, but when you're the only one standing up in choir, basically on the platform, it was just kind of weird. It just felt weird. But um, when I sat down, the person next to me said, how long have you been married? And I said, 36 years. And they patted me on the back and said, that's amazing. <laughs> and I was like, it shouldn't be amazing, <laughs> but I guess it kind of is. And and the most common question is, why are you married? Why, how have you stayed married this long? And um, one of the first things that we we usually talk about is, well, for what you've basically been talking about, a common, our common commitment that God is the one that sets the foundation for our decision making in marriage, not our moods or our own um, yeah feelings, our, our own emotions. feelings. Emotions. Marriage isn't supposed to make you happy. It's supposed to make you holy. I think we've said that before. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> that before though yeah it's uh well it's sanctified marriage is a tool through which god can use to make us more like himself relationships yeah. with one another and so we when you and i come into this marriage we came into it understanding you know hey yeah there's cool things that come with it the romantic stuff is all there but at this stage of the life the romantic stuff has its place but it's not front and center it really well, wasn't and front and center for us anyway in the get in the beginning yeah. it, i mean no it felt like obedience and in fact it was its obedience, no matter which one really draws you. You have an attraction that's somewhat just a you know physical thing God has put in us, hormonal as well as uh, time in life when when we're at the reproductive stages. You know God puts those things in us. He's given us that natural um, fire desire and desire. fire. Yeah, but but the word love gets confused too. This is all from reading that pamphlet. 
um, by Keith Green, which I keep around because it's just so well written. It's very basic and simple, but it's just very well done. Um, that love itself, love cannot be a feeling. It has to be an action. So if you get married for, quote, love, you're not, are, are you describing hormones or, <laughs> well, or choice? Yeah. Now, a choice to con- con- uh, to label maybe the whole picture as love, I think that's okay. Like to combine the, the attraction part of it with God showing you this person will uh, walk with in the same way or same pathway as you, like not being unequally yoked kind of idea, as well as then choosing. You're making a choice to love. Now, love is confusing because love, according to the Bible, is really only an action term. It's only a statement of... It's sacrifice. Love is giving action. yourself up for yeah. the benefit of another. For yeah, the- which, but when is that ever really... Like for God so from this the perspective, world, back in the love son. revolution, yeah. you know, that wasn't what it was about. It was feelings. It was all. Well, yeah, there, exactly. there was an am- amorous, I, was, I started to say amoriety. I was going to make up a word. <laughs> the amoriety of the human condition. Um, well, we're looking for something that's that's uh, temporal, that's fixed on in time. But in I was, I'm trying to think, you know, Jesus well, refers to us as to salt end. and light in the world. Well, that doesn't mean that we are um, just a thing where salt brings out flavor and gives meaning and brings value. In in Jesus' day, salt was currency, so it brought value to the world. And so... The problem with light is it's exposure. <laughs> it exposes what is dark. So if you mean like bringing salt and light to another person in a marriage, that's two sides of a coin. Salt may bring flavor and, and maybe all kinds of... Uh, like we think of it as a preservative. It brings longevity, and, and that's been proven even... Uh, for you know, for joy, for good qualities, but then light is a sounds like a good thing, but it also exposes. So it's got a whole full picture of what can be, but what we're not thinking when we're first quote married, and especially if you're coming from a secular viewpoint, that's not what you think of when you think of marriage. You know, you think of kind of a grandiose pro, uh, uh, proclamation from this person that they think of me more highly than others or you know it's it's about the statement of what we think we've understood love to be or what emotional heights we've gone with this person most time has to do with intimacy and it has to do with um, emotional connection but the problem is that's where it stops a lot of times we don't allow that to turn into a, a behavior pattern that we choose rather than a emotion that stops we give up because I don't love that person anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, and so I was, there's two things I was thinking about. Um, one is that when I was saying we are salt and light is that salt, and oftentimes when we're cooking in our society today, it's, it's an ingredient. It brings out flavor, right? Mm-hmm, right. So there's, a, there's an aspect in which um, love brings out flavor. Or, so I was thinking, is love an ingredient, at least the way we see it? We're focusing on an ingredient or an aspect of love rather than looking at the whole of love, when in reality... The Greek culture has the the word is in the in the New Testament when it's defined is defined from a Greek word, love is, and there's agape, eros is where we're stuck on as a culture, right? Erotic love, the sexual act, those kinds of things. But there's also philia, um, storge, fam, familial love, affectionate love, or Philadelphia is named for, for the Greek love word. Yeah, brotherly. Um, yeah. Brotherly love, even though it's not very loving, brotherly, and. Um, so these words, and then there's another one which I'm not familiar with. Is phil- I can't even say it. It's philatua, which is self love or healthy self esteem. These are all Greek terms for rather than an unhealthy narcissism. But understanding when it talks about us having a, a self sacrificing or biblical foundation of love, we are understanding that when we're approaching a marriage, we're coming at it from sure. There's an aspect of some of these other things because we have familial love because we've been married and we've grown a family together. So we have that familial love there. But we have an um, a agape love, an unconditional love that comes from God that we're emulating to that family, which feeds that familial aspect of things. So I guess what I was saying is choosing to foundation our marriage on something greater than an emotional or physical attraction, um, common likes and and common things. I mean, we did hold in common missions. We held in common a heart for, for, for the gospel. But those were not the defining things. It was our commitment to... to 
Christ being all in all, the center of all things for us together. That's what binds us together through everything. Because sometimes those those defe- other definitions changed or shifted, or um, we're even disagreed upon. Am I? Well, then obedience comes after that. When God puts two people together, whether or not it's a perfection of exact qualifications or exact personalities or sure. compatibilities, as the word world wants to put it, but then seeing that he's given attraction, he's given, like I said, walking together in a similar pathway like you just talked about with the same desires, then it's obedience because the Bible says not to burn with lust. So go ahead and get married. Well, then, but then the obedience goes further. The obedience is to stay and not let man put asunder what God has joined together. So it's a big deal. So another word for obedience in this would be um, we have the commitment to the foundation of belief, but then enduring is obedience. In this case, endurance yeah. is the belief. Is what yes, obedience and like in. we started out with, seeing a fuller, broader picture of the reason you're married in the first place and the purposes of marriage and the the depths of marriage. It cannot be that it is about me. It cannot be about the word happiness, even though I think it's in a, can be a part, it can be a, he, a big part, but it doesn't rule. The things that, so here's the thing. So what we're saying, I, I think, in essence, is the culture that we live in tends to place the value or the success of marriage and enduring in a marriage on, um, one way to say it's lagging indicators rather than leading indicators. Lag, a leading indicator is something that's going to move everything around it, whereas a lagging indicator is one of those things around it that's moving. In other words, they're they're saying, if I feel this way, then I I love you. If I don't feel this way, kind of I'm not in love with, with you it anymore. In that sense. When when the yeah, it's they're we're putting we're asking for results to define whether or not this marriage can work. Not now we can Rather look at results define and go what happens. In, yeah, yeah. Uh, results can say um, the marriage is is struggling at this moment, but the foundation is not, is where we're going to go back to the foundation and say what do we need to do to fix this result? How do we begin to influence? Um, our behavior, our core. Honestly, you know, you would talk about our faith, right? How engaged am I in my relationship with God? If I'm not engaged closely with my relationship with God, that has an impact on the happiness of my home, right? If my relationship or with any Christ, part of your life, really. Well, that's well, that's what I'm getting at. Which is, have, yeah. yeah, it's going to impact everything in my circle of influence, right? And so, well, and that's the whole only idea. Because... If you come home from work angry and you kick the yell at the wife, wife yells at the kid, kid kicks the dog, you know, the whole thing. It's just. But that's only happen. because going all the way back to you are only going to be truly fulfilled in this life, understanding your identity as a child of God and as a, a loved lover. But but that's true in any course of life. And we see people going along choosing the ways that, that has been, you know, kind of confused actually why they would even choose marriage if they don't really know the foundational purpose of marriage, which is that God said in the garden you know, this is yours. Well, here, I think here is that's a discipleship problem, right? Because yeah. if well, we're raising saying, people why up in the saying, world, in the you, literal world, that don't know him, why would they even? Because it's a cultural them? institution that's been. Right. Well, well, the reason we're seeing it fall apart in our culture right now is because the cultural institution forgotten. doesn't have the stamina to hold up the value of why it exists to begin with. Yeah. So why not just live together? I mean, whatever. But. You know, marriage was an institute was created out of a out of something larger. It was a commitment to one another to create and procreate a family, so that that your so that the the lineage endures, so that life in, on earth continues to flourish. And because what God puts together, men cannot separate. So God makes that a full picture of the creation that He intended when He split apart the Adam, ha ha, and made the split apart Adam, the Eve. Yeah, but it is. But that's what we understand and see. We know that the world in general doesn't know that or see that. So yeah, they accept some of the premise because it comes along with good stuff. Right. God has ordained right. these things to bring <clears throat> blessings, and people don't even know why. Right. And what I'm getting at is, I think that over time, because our country has moved away from biblical foundation, we are the the biblical foundation, which has shaped our culture largely in the beginning is beginning to fade along with it. And so you're asking, why do they do it? Well, yeah, there's still the flash or the memory of, right. it's, a, it's a cultural memory. 
it doesn't necessarily have, um, and it's kind of like, why is the, you know, there's a lot of memories that we have that we don't know where they come from, things that are happening, our habits and patterns, and we don't know why they're there. And it's sad um, because it's falling apart because it's that, that faith, that understanding, that foundation is not being passed on. It's like we're in a small town here in a, and in a small church in a small town, and we're seeing it passed on. We're seeing that people at least are helping their children understand faith in God and, and his established principles, his established, um, you know, story. But it's sad, a sad tale of the Western world that was established through Christian principles that are that are beginning to flail and fall apart. And it's a it's a sad thing because there aren't enough to stand up right now because it's not been passed on well. We got we got into this this last week. Um I I got a, a couple different places because some of what we're hearing about um you know different <laughs> Okay, so we talked a little bit about food this week. My kids were talking about, um, well, I, I sent them a thing that shows some of the dyes that are put in food and how they are bad for us. They're banned in Europe and whatever. That relating as as well to some of the things in our country that were be So that's kind of a deception thing. We're put stuff's put in our food. We're, make, we're making these convenience foods in order to, you know, start some almost like addictive type properties so they'll right. keep, continue to buy them and eat them and whatever. People don't know what they're doing. They just trust, sort of. Same even true with abortion. We back up all the way to Margaret Sainer, isn't it Margaret Sainer, and mm-hmm. the yep. birth control. That was supposed to be a great new freedom for Sexual women. Sexual liberty. And, yeah. And it disconnected any of the responsibility, or I mean, or somewhat, I guess. Sex without responsibility from, was the yeah, whole point. Of exactly. Yeah, exactly. People were deceived by it because it seemed as if it gave women a, a open now. They can go to work. They can do all these different things because now we have freedom to not be restricted by these, uh, you know, the children that you're having or the whatever, the home life, I guess. Um, sad day because in, a, in the West, we saw that as God's blessing and took off with it. Women went to work. Women now the uh, whole American dream and ambition could build up nice big houses and have all kinds of cars and whatever. And But now we've also sacrificed children, literally sacrificed mm-hmm. children, because it's come so far as now abortive rights are are seen as mainstream. They are just what they are. Yeah. Thank the Lord this last, whatever it was, three years ago, two, three years ago? Something. I don't remember. It was tw- when they when we, the Dobbs decision came down and freed our country at least of being a quote abortion state uh, or a you know country. Well, but, it, sh- it opened up the question, and this uh, is a conversation I'd like to explore in another podcast, I think. But yeah, because the, the whole um, you know is when does life begin? The questions. The point of it is, and here's my my thought for this is a good conversation is we're now allowed as a country to talk about something we weren't allowed to talk about before. <laughs> um, because that what the country is doing, you know, this, if you go back to 1973 or two, um, the seven, late 70s, early seventies, when this abortion thing came down, mm-hmm. um, basically what it did was it told the country, you can no longer talk about this. It's a settled matter, matter of settled law. And in my, reality, it wasn't and it, right. No, it it, it w- actually was not a, what do they call, um, codified into our no it's thank not the law, lord right. into our constitution not, right. that, and the reason it fell in the dobbs decision is because it wasn't and so for 50 years that battle's been going on but most people didn't talk about it they just say it was law well it wasn't so that's yeah. now it's back and so now all over the country there's reactions extreme and it's offensive to some and it's exciting for others depending on how you look at it. the point it to me is this is we're now having the civil huh, kind of civil war but civil conversation that we're supposed to be having about this. It's supposed to be something that's left. It's a moral foundation. It's not a, yeah. it's not uh, the government should it exists to protect our freedoms, to, to, to um, protects our, protect our freedoms and protect us from foreign invaders, to protect us um, from each other when we might inv- invade one another and to allow us to live according to our conscience. Um, and as long as it doesn't infringe upon those rights, well, they tried to turn this into a conscious right. And it, and it's now something we're having a conversation of at a, anyway, I didn't want to get into yeah. it a lot today because it's, I know. You know well, we I was trying married. to connect it to the idea that the de- deceptions in our country are subtle and have been 
they've been bought as something good and great and sets me free. Mm -hmm. And yet we've spoken often on this podcast about how actually the responsibility, the laws of God, the things that God gave us to set us free were were to set us free so we could do what he wanted, so we could be obedient to him rather than restricted by selfishness, I guess, really, in that way. Choosing selfishness is never freedom. We may think it is. It may feel like it at moments, but even you um, were answering some questions from a boy who's experienced divorce a long time ago in his life and just now trying to figure out why. And I'm glad for that. I'm glad he's asking questions, but it breaks my heart because neither Mm -hmm. one of his parents would think that it would affect him that way, likely. In that case, a family that spent was scattered because of the decision. Completely scattered. And, you know, oftentimes when, well, the thing is, and we could get into that a little bit too, because I don't want to say to people who didn't make it 31 years that you're terrible people. Well, the answer to the question is, of course, you're, you're terrible. 36, what did I say? <laughs> 31. <laughs> you so took Tony five and I have been away. separated for the last four years, but <laughs> no. living together the whole no. time. Um, so anyway, <laughs> five years. I didn't even count right. Really I, fix, bit, well, I didn't even fix true. the math right. I was a 20 for four years. Well, that's what do we do with that other year I just left out there? <laughs> Oh no, my gosh. but I, no. It's not to say that people don't struggle and that there's well, that, not. What I yeah. What I'm going to say is this: but, is that I want people to know who whose marriages haven't endured that that doesn't mean God can't protect your children, but it does mean this: that you became so much in much pain at some point in your in your relationship that you could no longer see the um the effect that it would have on the community around you, especially your closest community, which is your family. Now that being yeah, said, that's right. Um, I, I, what I would underline then is just what the point I what I just said was community is important. You need people outside of you who can advocate for a balanced wisdom in how to deal with your marriage. And that's one thing yeah. I, we haven't talked about, but that's true for us. It is. We have had the right people around us for all these years to remind us of what's important when we wanted to throw it out, which we never I would well, say wanted to throw it out. Just to be clear, you, when I say that term, we've never considered yeah. actually throwing it out. But we've, well, we, you, you still have the emotional moment. Well, I was going to say, the enemy comes against you. And you, I still think it's really up to your relationship to God because he has to give you the strength to say no to those personal, right. uh, you know, selfish desires that in the, in the immediate look so huge and overwhelming and, and not conquerable. So, but I would, I would argue that that family did have. They had around them counselors and people. Oh, you still have people. to make a choice to believe the counselor well, around you. yes, sure. and you have to have enough relationship with God to give you strength when you don't have any because yeah. you do not have the ability well, yourself goes... to wake your own eyes up to what you're doing. God is the one who brings in perspective the people around you that are more valuable than what you think right now you need or want or right. The anger or the whatever it is, the selfish, the hurt, the pain, whatever it is that you're dealing with right now, even if there's been legitimate failures in a marriage, there are still bigger consequences that you have got to consider that right now it may not feel that big, but it will later. And if you don't consider it now. So you're right to have counselors and helpers guides around you, people what you're who saying, are to listen struggled, to counselors. To listen or, to them. Yeah. Because, and to understand they've struggled like you have. And that goes back to your point earlier about staying humble, about being willing to submit to one another, being willing to hum- humble yourself and not think that what you think in a moment is the most important thing. Ugh, yeah. Because it's okay? not easy. Because sometimes when you're in a lot of pain, you can't see beyond your own pain. You just, and here's the thing. Sure. Have people around you that'll hold you back when it comes to, because you're talking about listening to good con- godly counsel. Well, there are people that you'll listen to in a good group of people. And there's people, if your mother says something to you, you're going to, that's, she has the power because of her relationship with you to literally hold you back. If you were dead set on something and your mom said, don't, you would, you would struggle more with the value that she holds that so holds over you in that than your own. And you're saying as a spiritual behavior. counselor, not really as my counselor. mom, because some people don't hold that with no no i'm saying i'm saying i said in your relationship with your mom your your mother and your relationship is and i would say an ad has been an advocate for our marriage all through all 36 years of it even um no no matter where she's been in her own journey she's always been a champion for ours well because of knowing exactly what i'm saying the problem with a lot of times is you can't see your own situation you can look at someone else's 
and see the detriment that would be in our case it would have been ministry as well as our kids yeah. as well as whatever there's a there was a heavier price to pay if selfish desires and wants or whatever needs of the moment could overcome but so some people can't don't maybe don't have that weight of that but yeah the problem with that is who do who do we trust? And a lot of times in those moments, we trust ourselves, and that's all we trust. And yeah, that's that goes back the to the humility part. point. Yeah, you you have to be willing to humble yourself enough to say, I don't know if I'm trustworthy right now. That's self awareness is another word for that. Yeah, to be well, aware of the fact that you know what, maybe I'm crazy. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'm actually crazy right now, and that well, and that's the battle. The that's maturity. what Paul talks about about taking his life. Take well, you talked about taking things captive. Didn't you say that earlier? Yeah, in this, and, yeah um, I read that. And having that Bible, I was going to say that was in this conversation. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, so well because there's so many different things you're fighting at those moments, and I remember my sister when she was really struggling, wanting to be willing to do whatever to walk through whatever to avoid ultimately what felt like disobedience to her because she could see it in the scripture. So she praised God for the way He handled that with her. He let her hang on to the truth. And then it was just done to her. Right. Now, still, I believe her integrity is intact, but she would still say that was so hard and painful. There weren't children involved. There wasn't anything. But her relationship to her felt like um, it should have been resolvable. It should have been God should have been able to be, you know, putting that back together if it was his will. And she was willing to go through whatever it took, which... I'm just so she's my hero in that way because I don't know that I would have been able to. And the the selfish times that I've dealt with thoughts like that and then or struggled with someone else, that's huge to put aside your own self to want what God wants. And and I think of um, people who have like lost a child or dealt with big, huge tragedies and then having to choose that they can see their partner either their own their struggle as well because you have to know that the other person's struggling you have to open your eyes to there's also some one else involved in this mm-hmm. or um the idea is that god has a bigger thing going on here and then sometimes like in her case it's just out, it's taken out of your hands and that's okay too because god knows this and he's able to deal with it and help you through to heal but um i just think it's it's such a it's such a challenge to, to go directly and find God's strength to do whatever it is that is obedience at those times. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I, okay. So the part of what started our conversation today on this uh, was I told you I'd read an article. So I want to kind of transition to this. But let me see if I've got this right. I was, well, because we've talked about some of it, but there's a specific thing in this article that I think is interesting, and it was a big deal for us. But just to just to recover, re, to recap, Coop. if I heard mm-hmm. you right, recap. tell me if I've missed anything. To see, so far for us, the secret to a healthy marriage was our common commitment to a central belief being our relationship with God and the foundation of all things. Our obedience and endurance within that construct. We made that our foundation, so no matter what we faced, we knew that that was our priority. And then understanding our own relationship to Christ in that a spiritual personal relationship mm-hmm. mind your spiritual life in other words if you take care of your own spiritual life it's going to help you to see correctly around you and then the last thing that we just talked about was good godly counsel have um have the right people around you and I I, I can made hold the, up your arms like Moses <laughs> hold, but, and I made this statement and I have this question I almost don't want to ask it but um but I, but I might uh let me say let me define this first but good godly counsel when I made this statement having people who can hold you back and I talked about your mom and the power that she and you talked about it the power that's there because you because you you have value to who she is and um and you trust her wisdom and how she's been helpful in our relationship the thing that crossed my mind was what she did have what others have had there's others in our lives who've had that but um is does it say something that if you've reached a point where you have lost so much hope in your relationship um, that you can't see a way to health, is that a statement of a lack of community? In other words, if there was a constant conversation, in, in other words, that good godly counsel isn't something you just get when you hit despair. It's something you need mm-hmm, to find right. all along the way. It's more of a, like you said, Moses, the battle's been raging the whole time and you need 
someone just to be there to hold your hands up whenever your arms mm-hmm. get tired mm-hmm. and help you. And so if because if you don't, you wind up at that point of despair. Without that, you you're, you're spiraling in direction unless people come along and help you out of it. Is that you see what I'm asking? I'm thinking I'm answering it in my own. Yeah, I think so. I think that's a combination though, because if you're in the Word. The Bible even says that if you happen to be married to someone who isn't following God at all, doesn't have a heart for him even, you have to believe that God can change that situation if you're staying there because the Bible says you can stay there, but you're going to have to do some heavy praying and therefore staying really strong in your own faith. So there's no way to do that without that. When you, if you get disillusioned and just a a good godly relationship even, it's still going to be God's, uh, my prayer throughout our marriage at times when I couldn't even really look at you. My my hurt, my pain was so big that you were not attractive to me. You weren't, you know, I didn't want to be with you. I didn't want to next, whatever it would be that God would give me his love for you because I wasn't capable of it and couldn't find it, couldn't drum it up. So, so first would be your relationship with God who, you can trust to do those things in you. Then, yes, to have friends, uh, spiritual mentors, people who will pray with you for those exact things. You have to be really vulnerable. I was never quite, I never had those enough to be quite that vulnerable with. And And it saddens me. And so there were times where it was really hard. But I had moments like a conference here or there or a woman's um, renewal weekend or things like that where I could get real with God and with women, other women who were struggling, because that was usually what it was. If you can find someone who struggled the same or struggled in similar ways, especially in marriage, then you can say, good, I'm not alone. And number two, I they're fighting the same fight. Yeah. That means I can fight. But it's, it's, ma- it's more maintenance than, it, um, than collision. Is, is what I was getting at. And I, that's what you're saying. I think that's what I'm hearing you say. You have these ongoing things that are you're running into you along the way that lifts second. you up or tear you down. You, you can't live what? life without people around you who are godly counsel. You don't wait till you're in trouble to get fixed. Oh. That, you know, and, and that's what... I, I think it's still possible. If you don't have a church home or a family that you're relating to normally and getting discipleship from, if that's what you're saying. If you get in a fix, we've had at least one example of someone coming to us when that was happening to them um, he was about to lose his marriage and came because he wasn't even walking with Jesus at all, kind of run away from God to some degree, came and begged you to help him because he thought he was going to lose his marriage. So yeah. that was a last minute and he seems to be doing fine now. So there sure. are examples sure. of that. And there are, and if you're that desperate, wanting that help, then you're also ready. The problem with all along is sometimes you can think you're, you can arrogantly think you're better than you are or in a different place than you are if you're right. careful too. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of both, I guess. Well, um, we're running a little bit out of, long on time, but I do want to talk about this last thing real quick. <laughs> that, was, that was very helpful. I appreciate it. Um, I read an article called, speaking of helpful, I read an article this week called The Five Love Languages Are Helpful But Not the Way People Think. Because one of the, <laughs> probably to wrap this up, we would say that communication has been a big part of success in our marriage. And that, <laughs> what, what are you laughing at? <laughs> Talking it out. Is that better? <laughs> Talking is helped with us, I guess so. It's funny because we don't, I still don't feel like, I feel like we're the typical communication barriers. And we have worse well, we than We are examples some. of how not to communicate. <laughs> no, I just mean we have, because we're extreme personality differences, we're extreme background differences, we have extreme, and we're both men and, you know, very wow. man and very woman. So we're, we speak the languages of that to our communication stinks most of the time. We're not able to even hear the other person talk how or you know correctly what they're saying. However, we keep trying, and well, we do enjoy talking, yeah. which I know a lot of people don't. So we get we try to get to the end of it because we don't mind to keep trying. If that's what you're getting at, I'm assuming. Well. All I was getting at was the, that's the title of the article, oh. and we've tried to communicate all this time. Um, so I wasn't communicating that well, he clearly. Well, have seen it as valuable, if that's what you mean. Yes, well, we definitely have. The, the thing is, is one of the things that we've done throughout our marriage is we've we've oftentimes read materials or we've shared and in, in learning experiences together as a married yeah. couple for the benefit of our, of our couple. Yeah, I don't know if you know this right. or not, but one of the things that's come about is a book that Gary Chapman wrote way back – Early in our marriage, and uh, <laughs> but, um, the Call of the Five Love Language is now pop culture. 
It's you can get an app. You can find it. It's one of there's a whole in, there's, there's a, apparently an entire TikTok channel dedicated to it. So and, it's separated and I've, completely and I've, from and the I've spiritual heard, aspect, is what we're saying. Well, or the languages themselves have become culturally popular. Yes, ish. Um, because here's what's interesting to me about it is that so the what happened was it it happened it's become so culturally phenomenal that uh, scientific researchers, psychological researchers, decided to put it to the test, and so they actually put groups of people together oh, to take these five love languages and try to try them out. Interesting. And their conclusions were that um, – that uh, let me see what I can find their conclusions. Uh, can the, the, I, the love languages can be taken as a whole but not solely relied on as the way things work in life. That's kind of what I walked away from it, which my response to that was, well, yeah – um, but I mean, there's, there's apps and everything. It can't be like the it. full picture. Yeah. yeah. And so one of the people that was interviewed, you know, love languages don't come to bear with, they, they had tragedy or something in their lives and it makes the love languages strained and, <laughs> and those kinds of things. It's well, just, it's not just learning about well, like when she was, this person was diagnosed with cancer and they're saying it, love languages weren't really working. They they used them in their marriage and they were helpful, but they were not because they were dealing with something else. Well, an example, too, is even just you and I were completely different in that category. I need this quality time. I need. But when we when we so these podcasts have been helpful because we can talk. However, on our normal basis, when we try to talk, sometimes our communication is just really bad. Well, that kind of tears at it. However, your love language doesn't have anything to do with that. So you're not even a really as affected as I am. Yours is more about uh, uh, words of affirmation or touch. Mm -hmm. And if those things aren't really high on our list, then you those are more going to bring you down and think that our marriage is over if I'm not able to build you up in the middle of these struggling times, right? I am the salt of the earth <laughs> for you. <laughs> on a regular basis, that life means something. And uh -huh. my poor son is in college Maybe just the pepper struggling of with the that earth. reality. Would that work? I'm the salt and, pe <laughs> salt and pepper of your life. By the way, um, <laughs> no. it was this was, this subject matter was even featured, not this group, but the, the five lovers was featured on The Bachelorette. Oh, my gracious. And it was also on, um, it was also, it was a quiz and like the Bumble dating app. You can take a love languages quiz and a part of the matching process. Interesting. So that's that's how serious you our know, culture has taken it. Chapman himself, by the way, just for the rest of the article summary, Chapman himself was flattered that it's happened. Yeah. And he said that he agreed with the research and appreciated that his work had drawn the interest of researchers, yeah. which it really didn't. The work itself didn't draw it. The fact <laughs> that it went culturally phenomenal drew it. Um, and so what he basically said. But Chapman said, probably would not would say, but apart from God, none of this is really going to work to its fullest, right? I mean, so it could work little bits. If if my love language is gifts mm -hmm. and nearly every day you brought me home a gift, it's going to mean that I feel loved by you and you have noticed that about me. So for a right. woman, that's valuable. The other side of that might be if I'm not able to, like in our situation, if I'm not able to give you words of encouragement or affirmation almost every day, you may or may not respond to that because you're a guy. So guys don't always have to, they're not emotionally strung out, <laughs> for lack of a better way to put that. I don't know, you just said women I was are. a minute ago. You said that <laughs> no, I can't survive a day I mean, without you telling me that, you know. I'm, it's not at all what I'm I said. I'm emotionally strung out. If I, I go no, ahead, I, I said you're not affected by the same things right. in our communication right. problems that I might And be. Chapman says that about his book. He says the reason he wrote that book was because he noticed that if he did all the chores and everything else and washed the dishes, it didn't exactly make his wife feel perfect. better. So he said he needed to look into it. And so he began to study diff study his wife. And so th and that the Five Love Languages book grew more out of that anecdotal research. And then he took biblical things and applied that yeah. that way. And um, Yeah, it cannot be an absolute. In fact, again, if all you did was bring gifts home, to a person whose love language who's was gifts. Who's desperately needing someone to talk to. Well, I was going to say, yeah. where's the rest of the relationship? It cannot be. And there's a pile and pile and pile of stuff everywhere, but I'm not sure there's a great relationship going yeah. on. <laughs> right. That's just the best example I can think of. I love gifts, but I think the gifts that come to me based on someone knowing me are the best value. So, like, if you've noticed something that I've noticed and hadn't told you about— that's going to be a lot further of a, a value in our relationship than just something. Now, that's because I don't know if I think my love languages have grown over the years, you know, kind of to balance, especially because we do get to spend think, a lot yeah. of time together now. That's not maybe quite as uh, detrimental as, as it used to be when I was 
needing human interaction from having kids all day, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, like we started this podcast out, I think, earlier saying that we see each other all the time now. We don't need to podcast. <laughs> yeah. I, but no, we enjoy what, talking through things, though. We, no I, I enjoy what. this every time we do it. We need to remind ourselves that and there's so many things we could talk about that are now. We need to do that because it's good for us. Um, but one of the, the, the article itself, I think, ended well in that it said the last sentence in the article <laughs> says, thriving relationships occur when you have a partner who understands and knows you, sees what you need, and is there to meet with you in that moment. In other words, it's, and, and Chapman himself says this, he said, all of these love languages are not, are not static. They, they move, they interact, they ebb and flow with one another. Mm -hmm. Then that's true of personality inventories. All of these things are meant to give us an idea of how we're we're how we lean, yeah. not They're how we live. Not, it's, it's, yeah. I'm comfortable in this lane. I'm comfortable, as you put it, in the um, in my words of affirmation lane. I want to tell you you're awesome, and I want you to tell me I'm awesome. That makes me. That's the most comfortable conversation we sit around and talk about how great we are to each other. <laughs> that, that's not what I meant to say, but that I like that. I kind of like that, so I'm gonna stick with that. You know, I, I me and Judah need to sit down. With, Judah, I just want to tell you you're the most awesome person. I, Dad, I think you're the most awesome person too. And, and by um, the time you're done, you're like, who are we? Yeah. Well, we both <laughs> Where'd go. We go? We go well, what we would generally do is we, we need to go find someone who doesn't have our love language to yeah, tell us exactly. this. If if mom says it, you know, Judah would say, if mom says it, then I believe it. If you say it, you're just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. mom, you know, from mom, it's a real sacrifice. You have no, mom saying that. that you've done good. You've done good. No, it's, but the thing is, it's not, again, the love language conversation, when it's strive to communicate. I guess if I had to make this a like a bullet point to our list of bullet points that I've had, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> commitment, to... essential belief, obedience, endurance, understanding who you are in Christ, good godly counsel. I'd say strive to connect or communicate. Yeah. Make, make the work of connecting with your spouse, um, the goal, not the fruit. In other words, it just because we don't always connect doesn't mean that we can't and we're not going to keep working on it. How many times have we ended a fight and we've just held hands or... Um, or, or I can still remember we had a big argument one time. I remember going somewhere and we fought over something that I no longer recall what it is. If you ever, if you remember this and do, was. don't yeah. tell me you do. Okay. <laughs> Give me the pleasure of not, of, of going, oh, it wasn't that important. Cause if it was important, I don't want to bring it up again. But the point of the matter was, was whatever we were fighting over. We got to a point where we didn't, we were done. We weren't talking to each other, but we we're on a long car ride together. <laughs> and I just remember Which that. Which is part of, yeah, most a lot, of our existence in our younger years. <laughs> long car rides because we were so far from everybody. Okay. But I, I think at just some point I reached over and took your hand and you took mine and we just held hands. And that was the end of it. I think we did rehash some things later on. Usually we do. We usually mm -hmm. come back to it. But um, well, but, but, but by it's that just time, that connection yeah. that we found a way and to connect. Will, that was a conversation willing. in itself. Yeah. Um, because it was a it was a statement of I, I'm committed to you. Yeah, and I'm willing I, to get past this, whatever it takes. Yeah, and if I can summarize thirty six years, I'm yeah. committed. To you. That was not supposed to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I just, that Amen. Made, that, that <laughs> so if you got to this far in the podcast, it's irrelevant. We're going to end it now because I'm not. I'm a mess. <laughs> but um, uh, I should you, be Jesus. I should be committed because of you. That's what I was trying to. <laughs> Oh, great. Okay. That's, that's, now negating everything we just talked about. No, that's now trying to stop being uh, emotionally involved in this relationship. I am emotionally involved in a relationship. Okay, oh, no. Good. Also, I should add, we should be emotionally involved in a relationship. Anyway. Okay. You're funny. We're a mess, and we've been a mess for 36 years, but we're yeah. a good mess, and we're a shared mess, and we're going to try and make it for the And next we're going to keep on making messes. Yeah. I mean. Maybe we should make this an <laughs> annual podcast. Next year will be, how have you stayed married? Thirty. How many years was it? 32, one, six, eight years together. I don't know. My goodness. Let's just end this mess. And you know what? Here's the thing. This song sums it up. Our marriage That's success right. is because... Keep on! That's right.